surgery and a place for the car. The program? So uh, welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theater Center. And again, thank you for watching our propaganda videos. Um, <laughs> we think it's like television. You know, you watch it a lot of times, and then you believe it's true. And uh, yeah, but we are proud of what we are doing. And again, uh, thank you for coming out on a cold November night. I do think it's a very special program tonight, and we have planned it for a long time because we have uh, talked about it, and Marvin have talked about of this project for a long time. We have Marvin Carlson's book uh, celebration, the first one of, I think, three. One will be at the Drama Bookstop, Bookstore, and one will be at the Arta Conference. Um, it's uh, 10,000 Nights, highlights from 50 years of theater going. Marvin Carlson really went uh, over 10,000 times to the theater, and uh, we, I think we even put it forward to the Believe It or Not uh, 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 book, but they said we need to see the tickets, and we, we, couldn't, we couldn't produce them, but they said he would be the record holder. Um, and they haven't heard of anything like it and close to it. So um, it is quite remarkable. So that is a great question. What does remain? What does one remember? And it's a question of theater itself and of memory and so much that Marvin has also written about. So then we will hear a bit from him about it. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the Siegel Theater Center. And we do Bridge Academia and Professional Theater International and American Theater. And of course, Marvin's book is really on national but also international theater and of course on academia, but also on really on the object of study of theater, the performance bodies on the stage. So uh, it's a very unique book, and we're going to talk about it. And uh, Marvin, come to us. Thank you. Okay. So I also would like to welcome our uh, delegation from the Shanghai Theater Academy. We have. Uh, 10 students visiting and the three faculty members in exchange between the PhD program in theater here and uh, the Shanghai Theater Academy. And the reason is there is a Marvin Carlson Theater Center. And it's at the very beginning. The opening was just November 1st, where Marvin also was uh, in Shanghai. So he is a, a world a traveler. And, um, and I think also it's an important contribution in his work and life. It reflects actually what we all should be thinking about in global terms of theater in terms of dramaturgy and also on the, on the uh, theater, how it uh, appears in, in, in different forms and faces and masks around the world. And surprisingly, many things are closer than one thinks, and many things are much further away than um, it, it appears. So uh, Marvin, again, thank you for coming. And the great honor that we have you here as the first uh, uh, celebration of your book. And um, can someone hold up the book? So have you all seen it? So here, this is the, the book cover. It should still smell uh, like fresh paint, that beautiful, fantastic uh, 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 print smell, which I, I really do love. And uh, let's start right away, Marvin. Um, why did you decide to do such a, a kind of a book? It's not a biography. It's not a collection of reviews. How, how, how did that all start? Um. Well, I, the first, uh, well, first of all, I must say it, it is, it's, it's great fun to be here. Uh, I, I, as you all know, I love the Siegel Center. I'm here a lot. Uh, it's a treat to be up and up on stage, uh, and following so many 
distinguished scholars and artists on this stage. So I have to thank Frank for setting that up and his wonderful crew who uh, I was able for the first time to, to watch them putting all the evening together and it's really very impressive how, how professional and, and well organized they all are. Uh, having said that, let me, let me respond to, the, to Frank's question. Uh, it was not my idea to write this book. It, indeed, I don't know that it ever would have occurred to me. Uh, though once I started doing it, I thought, well, it seems like a good thing to do. Uh, the, uh, the idea came from uh, one of the great uh, editors in the field, uh, Leanne Fields, who was the, in charge of the theater section of the uh, University of Michigan Press, has, and she has uh, published and encouraged and developed many, many important texts in the, in the modern theater. She got a, a well-deserved uh, award from one of our national organizations as an editor just last year. Uh, Leanne, uh, three or four years ago, came to me and said, uh, have you ever thought about writing an autobiography? And I said, no, I've never thought about it. Uh, and I, I'm not particularly interested in thinking about it. Uh, the, uh, I can understand that uh, you might want an autobiography from me if I were, I don't know, Robert Wilson or Tony Kushner, uh, but I've never done much of anything other than teach uh, and publish and work in the theater. And uh, she said then, you have seen more plays than anybody I know. Uh, I, I think it would be very interesting for you to think back over your career theater going and write about your experiences in the theater, how the theater has changed, uh, how your attitude about theater has changed. And that really fascinated me. I, I, I thought about it for a long time and the biggest problem was how to do that. That is, uh, uh, as as Frank says, I've been I've been going to a lot of plays. I, I have, I've slowed down a little in the last few years. I only go to about 200 plays a year now. <laughs> I used to go to about 300 plays a year, um, but I still go three or four nights a week. I mean, it's just something I do, uh, and it's just it's, it is just a part of my life. So, if you think of a career that started in the late 50s. It is, as Frank says, well over 10,000 productions. Uh, the biggest problem then is you can't write about 10,000 productions. What on earth do you do? Uh, and this is the part that where I actually contributed something because the idea came from Leanne, and that was to take a 50-year span. When I first really began going to the theater, quite regularly, which was right at the end of the 1960s, 1950s, and take, the 50, uh, take a 50 year period, 1960 to 2010, write about one production each year, a short essay that was not a review, but really was a, uh, uh, a report or a memory of what it was like going to the theater at that time. And that would be, uh, this in a way reflects a change in the way we think about theater. Uh, along about the 1970s or 1980s, there really was a shift in, in, in criticism about theater and understanding of theater, shifting from an idea of the theater experience as an object to the theater experience as an event, something that happened, something that was embedded in experience. And that runs through everything that I'm talking about. What kind of event was it to go to this play at this time? And that means I talk about such things as uh, the, the development of off-off Broadway, the spaces, the different kinds of theaters, uh, the development of, of different styles of acting, uh, with as many specific details 
as seemed relevant to that, and these include such things as the, the, the problem of getting into Segretovsky, literally getting into the theater, physically getting into the theater, and so on, uh, uh, or the problems of physically getting into uh, Spirit House, uh, Barak, uh, Amara Baraka's uh, project out in New Jersey, if you happen to be white. Um, uh, so uh, there's sometimes I talk about uh, I talk about going to the old automat uh, to have dinner before going to some of the early Broadway or Times Square shows. So it's 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 much contextualized, and the idea is to try to give people a feeling of walking along with me. What was it like going to that production at that time? So that's that's where the idea came from. And that's how I developed it. So in a way, you're responding to, to Wagner and Meyerhold and Piscata, the total theater. You have a total, the total event. The total event. That right, uh, right. Uh, uh, you, in a way, it's a, it's a new way. I mean, uh, unusual way, I think, of, uh, of, of, of looking. It's not a theater review. It's not an academic, uh, I think, a thesis. It is really um, 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 trying to describe the, the atmosphere, which is significant, I think, to, to feel what was the atmosphere like. And, Paris in the fall of 68, or how was it on the Cornell campus when uh, Peter Schumann smuggled out uh, someone wanted by the FBI? How was, yes. how, wh how, how was it when at uh, Mary Biraka you didn't uh, say the whole uh, anecdote in the book? It says someone said to Marvin, who was waiting in line, get your white ass out of here, go back to Manhattan, and he did. So this was uh, the end of the review. Um, but um, so it is, it, is, uh, it is, I think, a, a wonderful way to really think about theater and really to have the performance, the bodies on stage in the center of the, uh, uh, of, of the uh, evaluation of what, it, what, what we do. But in very also simple terms, why, why should we go to the theater at all? Since you have 10,000 10, times, what? What, what, what's your, uh, why should we actually do that? That, 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 that's a very difficult question. Why on earth would I spend that much of my time doing that? Well, I guess this really goes to why we go to the theater at all. Uh, and, and the answer to that is, I think, a very complicated one because we go to the theater for a lot of different reasons. Uh, we go to the theater as we, as we participate in any art just for the the enrichment that it gives us as human beings, the, 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 uh, the, the, uh, the greatest moments that I've had in theater are like, and I mean just moments, are like the greatest moments I've had, let's say, listening to music, where suddenly there's a kind of a, a thrill over your whole body and you think, this is it. This is why I'm here. Uh, not only here in this space and watching this thing, but here as a human being at this point in time. Now, how often does that happen in the theater? Maybe once every five years. But it's worth it. <laughs> and every time, this might be the one. And when it does happen, it's, it'll carry you through the next three or four years. Uh, <laughs> or it, do, it does me. Uh, and I, I would say that's the top of the experience. But then, uh, in addition to that, of course, there is the, the uh, there are, uh, there's a wide range of other payoffs from the theater. Uh, uh, being studies of human experience, it enriches your life. You get to see and speculate and, and think about uh, people in various uh, social, political, uh, romantic conditions and how they deal with these. Nothing is more interesting than other people and seeing stories about other people and how they deal with, with situations is obviously pleasurable itself. We all love to tell stories and to hear stories and I think no stories are better than stories that are enacted. They're, I mean, that just gives that that extra dimension, that extra power. Uh, I, I, I love the, uh, the, the, the sense of being a sentient body, watching other sentient bodies doing something interesting, especially when they're particularly good at it. Um, the, 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 uh, uh, so there, 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 is, there is that kind of pleasure. 
uh, there is just a pleasure of, of uh, which is related to this, of expanding your horizons, uh, just getting out and seeing uh, another way of looking at life. And then, and this is by no means the least of these, there is the great pleasure of coming back to the Graduate Center and talking with my friends about things we've seen. What did you think of that scene or that act or that? And I assure you that uh, half the conversations that go on among the students and the faculty here are, did you see such and so, and what did you think of it, and so on. Uh, it is a, uh, it gives us something vastly more interesting to talk about and vastly more pleasant to talk about than politics. <laughs> so those are so, I mean, but the, I, I, the, I could go on and on, but those are, that's a rail. No, no, thank you. It's, uh, of course, a basic question, but, but really, uh, thank you for sharing. I mean, we had Taylor Mackey at the last uh, DTSA uh, celebration, the Booth Award, and he came up with the American Songbook in a way uh, this is Marvin's playlist or Marvin's uh, theater songs you like. Um, tell us a bit about the, the, the process. Is it a new canon you were looking for or what, what was the idea behind? Are you establishing also one in, unintentionally and what was the process? Well, uh, to answer to go to the canon directly, absolutely not. Uh, the last thing I would want to do is establish a new canon. Uh, uh, I, we, we've spent the last 20 or 30 years trying to get rid of canons, and I would hate to be guilty of setting up another one. Uh, I, I, uh, I do think that, uh, and certainly as I was putting this together, there are a variety of obvious th choices that I, I decided not to do. Uh, one was picking the 50 plays that I liked best. There are many plays here that I really didn't like at all. Many productions <laughs> I really didn't. But I thought they, they, they allowed me to say some interesting things about the theater at that time or certain trends in the theater at that time. Uh, I guess it's closer to a, it's like Taylor Mack in a sense, is it is a kind of, uh, a kind of personal history of going through a particular period. Uh, but it is a personal history, and, and that which is almost the opposite of a canon. This is, uh, uh, and it is, uh, as I say, it isn't even a matter of these are my fifty great plays of the last uh, the last fifty years. There are a number of plays that I enjoyed as much as the as the my favorites that I talk about in the book that didn't make it into the book. Uh, the the. Uh, uh, also, I did not try, even, and I'm not sure it could have been easily done, but it, I could have come closer to it than I did. I didn't try to pick the 50 plays that everybody would expect to see here. There, I, it, it, inevitably, people are going to look at this book and say, how is it possible that you didn't have such and such a play? Yeah, one could say O'Neill, uh, Williams, Miller, Shepard, Albee, David Mount. <laughs> Um, right. I think Arthur Miller's only in because of Dustin Hoffman, you know, but so... Uh, well, so uh, now, for, first of all, I would have to say Miller does make it in, but it's after the fall. And people would say, dear God, why in the last 50 years would you pick after the fall? Well, there are a variety of reasons. We haven't even got to how, what, what, what was operating in my selection. But one of the main reasons for after the fall is that it allowed me to talk about a number of very important things that were going on in the theater and in theatrical consciousness at that time. And one of them is indeed the evolving reputation of, uh, of uh, Miller at that time, particularly, of course, his relation with Marilyn Monroe and the great scandal about whether, in fact, the actress in After the Fall was specifically modeled on, on, on Marilyn Monroe and the whole question of, of how autobiographical should a play be. There's all kinds of interesting questions of that kind that come up around that production. Uh, but equally important was that uh, uh, at that, that production was planned to be the opening production at the new Lincoln Center, the first new play in what was supposed to be 
America's Comédie Française or America's National Theater. And none of that worked out. The Lincoln Center wasn't yet finished. A, a temporary theater was built down in the middle of Washington Square. That was where the production was done. Uh, and this allowed me then to talk about the whole dynamic of establishing a national theater in New York, the problems with the beginning of Lincoln Center, the, the delay of Lincoln Center, the, the choice of going into the middle of the village in order to do this, uh, what the dynamics of that theater was, why they decided to do a thrust stage rather than a proscenium stage, and so on and so on. All of this is the reason, or these are among the reasons that I decided to write about After the Fall. And I could do, th I could do that kind of thing with each example in the book. No play really is in there because everybody said, oh, this is a great play. Uh, it is in there for, for usually a variety of other reasons. I guess probably the, 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 pr the production that would come closest to that would be Angels in America, which really is kind of a pivotal moment in the, in the American theater. But there are very few out of the 50 plays that you would say, oh, well, if I were doing 50 productions, you would have to include this one. I think the great majority of them people would say, well, no, you really didn't have to do that. And in, in, in many cases, I had a, a, a variety of choices. That is, if there is one thing that I felt I have to do or I want to do is I want to include a particularly important example of the work of certain groups. As I do think that, that one of the things that uh, that uh, characterizes the American theater of the late 20th century, uh, particularly, of course, the, uh, the, the experimental theater. And I do, I do unashamedly favor the experimental theater over the, the standard commercial theater, though I do have a number of Broadway productions in it. Uh, one of the things, maybe the thing that characterizes that is the importance of a number of, uh, of particular groups, the Wooster Group, or Mabu Mines, or Richard Foreman, or so on. I felt each of these groups, all of which I, I followed almost play to play over a period of time, uh, I would include Charles Ludlam's Theater of the Ridiculous. These are groups that I felt they must be represented. But having said that, then in many cases I did not take the play that I thought best represent that group. I, for, and there are several reasons for that. Sometimes the play that I thought really ought to represent that group, I had four other plays competing for that year. And I thought, well, I really need to do this, and so I'll pick them up somewhere else. Uh, and other times, the most famous play did not allow me to make points that I could make with a less famous work. I think the obvious example would be the, the, first, the first play in the book was really the first uh, memorable professional production that I saw in New York, and that was The Fantastics, which I saw the year that it opened. Uh, and, the set, and I, I think almost nobody would quarrel with that choice. Uh, but many people would quarrel with my second choice the next year, which it was uh, the, uh, the Connection by the Living Theater. And every, I think the normal reaction was, why on earth the Connection rather than Paradise Now? Uh, and I, I could explain that, but just I will just say, in many cases, uh, my particular selection of a bread and puppet play is probably not what everybody would agree with. I think with, uh, with Charles Ludlam, I knew there had to be a Charles Ludlam example in this. Many people would say, well, obviously it's the mystery of Irma Vip, but they're wrong. <laughs> obviously it's Camille. That is, for me, the great production. Uh, so in some cases, it is just a matter of personal taste. But usually, 
what decides me is which production allows me to move out from that production and, and give a kind of insight to the late 70s or the, the early 90s or whatever in the theater. So in coming to, to process, I think there was an, uh, a report about the great American uh, comedian, I think Joan Rivers, and they found about 10,000 note cards with joke and like in jokes she had in, in little metal uh, filing cabinets. How do you do, so do you have notes or uh, do you, how, how did that work? Ah, well, a, a good question. You think, uh, I mean, people who have read the book say, how can you possibly remember all that stuff? Uh, do you, do you really keep extensive notes? And the answer is no. The only, the only uh, time that I take extensive notes in the theater is on the relatively rare occasions where I actually have been appointed or commissioned to write a review and I know I'm going to have to have a lot of detail. Uh, and I have, a, I have a number of such notes. And, and of course, the, the plays that I did write reviews of, I have my own reviews. Uh, usually, and of course this, this differs production to production, but uh, what would very frequently happen is that I would, uh, I would be thinking about um, a, particular, a particular group or a particular artist and some moment or image would flash into my mind that I particularly remember this thing, this, this moment. Um, uh, maybe, it, maybe it was one of those these great thrilling moments that I mentioned, but it usually isn't. Uh, the, what, really the only thing just off the top of my head that I remembered in any detail about the connection was something that happened during the intermission. <laughs> and that got me thinking about the situation. And then once I had said, okay, I'm going to write about Marat Saad, or I'm going to write about uh, Angels in America, or whatever, uh, the, the, uh, I then went at it just like a traditional theater historian. That is to say, I went back, I read the reviews at the time, uh, I, I hate reviews, I almost never agree with them, but still they got me kind of back into the mood of the time. Uh, I would usually read the whole paper the review appeared in so I could get myself into the, the world of that period, uh, including the weather reports. What was it like the, the night I saw that play? And sometimes, you, you never know what's going to click. I will think, oh yes, I. I'd never been so cold in my life as I was. The night I went to see uh, After the Fall, it was bitter cold. It was just terrible. And of course, Washington Square is in the middle of nowhere. There's no, as you know, there's no subways nearby. Uh, you, you really have to go out in the, in the, the, the worst area, it, not, not in terms of safety, but in terms of distance from any warm spot. Uh, so, uh, all of these things fed into it. Uh, the, uh, uh, many of these groups, like the Living Theater, obviously, a number of books have been written about them. I would go back, I would read these. In some cases, I would say, oh yes, that reminds me of something in, in the play. In other cases, I would say, oh no, that's wrong. It really didn't happen that way. Uh, but they were all jogs to the memory, and the, the, as I kept looking into different reports, um, I, I have not kept the programs. I, I did for many years, but then they begin to overwhelm my office. Uh, but I did go up to Lincoln Center and get the programs and go back and look at them, and that, uh, all of these things, anything I could think of to jog the memory, look at photographs of the production and so on. So. Uh, and, and as I wove the web of the, of the material, then I, that would bring back things as well. When I was writing about um, uh, each of the, each of the non-New York productions, and I write about uh, uh, eight or 10 productions that are in other countries, mostly in Europe, uh, uh, in every one of those productions, as I was writing the book, I went back to that city 
I walked over the streets and tried to remember, this is especially important in Berlin, tried to remember what it was like before the wall came down. Uh, what, what, were the, what, 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 was the, what was the general feeling of the city at that time? And I did this with each of the cities that I worked on. So all of, and indeed I did that in some cases in New York. I went back to spaces that I hadn't visited in 20 or 30 years where, where I saw a particular production. And sometimes everything is gone. The building is gone. The neighborhood has changed. But in some cases, they haven't changed much. And all of that helped trigger memory. So it, it, was a, it really was a rather complicated process and a, a great a fun process. I love doing this. So, so you, one, one could feel that you were so happy that Cafe Reggio was still there after all these years where you, <laughs> over the 50 years, you could always go back and it's still there, you know? And that's right, that's right. Yeah. So um, even so, someone said theater really is about what you see and uh, what you hear. And what you describe is actually really very close to what you see and what you hear, perhaps also what you felt and smelled. I, yeah. Th yeah, let me, let me yeah. just give you one, one small example of that. That is, uh, <clears throat> I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a couple of productions in Berlin. One, one is before the wall and one is after. And going back and writing about the experience of going back over the wall into, into East Berlin to the, the Deutsches Theater. Um, as I was going back and retracing that and thinking about those spaces, uh, I went into the, uh, there, is a, there is a museum uh, near, the, uh, near the Friedrichstrasse station that is a museum uh, of the, uh, uh, of, of the, the, the Stasi, the secret police, and of the, the checkpoints and so on. And in the museum, they have recreated the little booths that you used to have to go through where you were examined by the East German police before you could go on into East Germany. And, and then you also had to go out, you had to be re-examined as you went back out. I had quite forgotten that, but I got into one of those booths, I thought, I remember this. I remember this, the feeling of this. So there, there, there was a lot of that kind of, of experience of, that came back that I wasn't at all expecting just to be in a, a particular space. Same thing in going in, uh, 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 when I was writing about the Lion King, I went, of course, as, as most of you know, the Amsterdam Theater is an incredible space uh, and it, with incredible interior decoration. And I remembered, how how impressive the interior decoration of the theater was, but I didn't remember in detail because I hadn't been looking at it in those terms. So I, I went, I somewhat reluctantly bought a ticket for Aladdin or whatever they were doing at the time, just to go back and walk through the spaces. And I, then I noticed things like, uh, as you go out of the space, as you go out of the theater, you look up, over the theater, the last thing you see in huge letters over the theater uh, as you're going out into the street is, is progress. And I thought, yes, I remember that. And I remember thinking, when I went to the Lion King, that was the only theater that had opened in the 42nd Street development. The, the Victory Theater was ready to open, but it hadn't opened yet. And that whole, the whole rest of that, that block was dark. Uh, all the porno shops had been closed down and they were getting ready to, to boost up the, uh, the, the, uh, that area. And I remember, then I remembered, and I'd completely forgotten this, when I saw the Lion King and saw this progress and walked out into the new 42nd Street development, I thought, this is wonderful. It, it now means something quite different from what it meant originally. I'd forgotten that, but going back to the theater, seeing that brought it back to me. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, so back to the question, even so we, you focus on what materializes what you see or what you hear, but also there is on the iceberg under it of, of kind of, of a theory. You can feel the, 
the kind of the heaviness also that you carry with you as a theater historian. And one could argue, perhaps, that there is a, also a journey from semiotics to reception and then to your, your theory of, of ghosting, uh, which you could also perhaps share. But is that, so does your work in theater, your theoretical work also, does it come really from theater going as much as from the books or more or less from, from reading the works of colleagues? How, how does it, what's the influence? Well, um, it, it, that, that's a good question, and again, this is something that other people pointed out to me that I was really not aware of. Joe Roach, pointed, who read, read an early copy of the book, said, you, you realize that as you're going through this, the theory is evolving as well, that you're thinking about theater in, in, in different and more complicated ways as you go along, starting with a kind of semiotic approach and, and as you say, moving into reception theory, and then, as the as it goes, as the book goes on, not surprisingly, more and more into the effect of memory on reception, uh, because the book is actually ultimately about that. Um, I think that's true, um, th and even as I go back and think about uh, how I saw the Fantastics and how I processed it the first time around was very different from how I would see it today because just what's happened in my own mind and what's happened in the theory. And I tried to get back into my mind at those times, but I never really thought that I was, that I was in fact writing um, with the idea of, of illustrating the use of theory. If it, it just it happens to be the way I think and the kinds of tools that I turn to. And uh, unlike some of the other books I've written, there's, I don't think there's a sentence in it which says, well, now looking at this from a semiotic point of view or whatever, no, it's not that at all. But, but anybody who knows reception theory or semiotic theory can doubtless say, oh, well, that's what's, that's what's behind this way of looking at the material. I did a... Uh, uh, I mean, just just the, the the example of of how important particular spaces are. The whole idea of of, of having the the uh, an archway that says progress as you're going out into the street. I did a book on the semiotics of theater architecture of what 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 do all these symbols and and statues and decorations mean in the theater, quite aside from what's going on on the stage. Um, so definitely there's that, that, way of, that way of thinking. This is also a shift in just in the field itself that by and large, 30, 40, 50 years ago, when people talk about a history of the theater, what they really meant was a history of what was going on on stage. They didn't think about a history of what was going on on your way to the theater, or what kind of a lobby the theater had, or, or wh wh where you would go for dinner before or after the theater. They didn't think of that as, as part of the total experience of theater. That's not my invention. Uh, I, I think the first theorist that really argued that seriously was Richard Schechner back in the 60s. Uh, but it is very much the way we think about theater now, and, and it is theoretically inflected, but I never thought of this as a, a, a theoretical book. I thought of it as a, as a historical book. Yeah, I think also Gertrude Stein early pointed out that half of theater is the ritual of going there, preparing, dressing up, meeting the friends, seeing the play, talking, going to dinner, that these kind of social ritual that it, that it provides is a... a Half of the um, half of, uh, of the soup. What I found uh, also um, uh, 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 interesting in your collection, like the Nabokov who collected the butterflies, or, or what a Humboldt who collected right. the stones. You, I, you feel like you went and with great care and described them and, and categorized them as a, was also a bit of, of a view from uh, outside, you know, not emotionally, personally, not with an agenda. But um, what I thought interesting when you go back to the connection is that there's some guy came to me in the intermission and talked to me and I didn't know was he an actor or not. Then you say Kwiatkowski, which maybe you also could talk about, he said, come in and 
welcome you, Nushkinit. So something happened, and there was first site-specific experiences. So I think it's a detection of, of a change, mm -hmm. and um, which you know I think not often is not really um, uh, so um, becomes so clear. So. Um, Especially you know, the, uh, your memory, I mean, of, of going to see the, 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 the Krotowski work, I mean, that's a stunning what you, how, what you felt, and um, if you could comment on it or... Well, uh, I think it is true that um, uh, in many cases, I'm not sure that I'd, I'd thought about this before, but as, as you say this, Frank, it does seem to me in many cases why I decided to talk about a particular production was that in that production, I became aware of something that I hadn't been aware of before. I haven't seen this in the theater before, or I haven't, or at least I haven't thought about this in the theater before. Uh, and I, uh, th this is another thing that, that keeps me going to the theater is uh, the surprise. There's, I, and, and there, I'm, sometimes it's an unpleasant surprise, but usually it's a pleasant one of, of uh, here's something new. I haven't seen anything quite like this before. It's, and even more pleasurable is I haven't seen anything like this. I haven't thought about anything like this before. And it makes me think about theater in a different way than I did before. And quite a number of the productions or that yeah. they're 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 opening up a uh, a different perspective. Uh, there are quite a number of the productions, certainly by no means the majority of them, but I think a significant minority. Where in fact, I have I am almost consciously um, not fitting in. I'm going to a theater that is uncomfortable for me or is different for me. Um, uh, maybe that's why I don't go to a lot of Broadway theaters. It's not so much the uh, the cost as it is I'm not surprised. I've seen it before. There's a kind of predictability about it, uh, and and uh, I, I this one of the things that that appealed to me about going to the theater the ridiculous is I'm I'm flagrantly heterosexual um, and. It, the, the whole the whole homosexual camp sensibility I just found fascinating uh, uh, and 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 being in it and being a part of it and 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 and, uh, and having that particular experience uh, I, I just found a, 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 a marvelous thing that uh, Frank said that mentioned the uh, the time that I went out to the Spirit House in Newark, uh, uh, when uh, uh, when uh, uh, Leroy Jones uh, Mara Baraka had uh, had opened his um, his theater there, uh, and it was in a really tough black neighborhood, and I felt already threatened just going there, uh, and I knew damn well I would be the only white face in the in the house. That wasn't the only time that happened, but uh, I I came to the door and was confronted by a big black doorman, who said, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "I came, I came to see the production." And and Frank quote, mentioned this. I mentioned this in the book, and he said, "You get your white ass back to the city," which I did. Uh, that was an extreme example. I, as a contrast, let me say that I often, now, let me say I went to a lot of black theater. That was the only time I ever had a problem. But very often I was the only white face in the audience. And, and I found that kind of experience really quite fascinating. I, 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 uh, over the years, I've often gone to the WOW Cafe. And in the early days, not quite so much anymore, but in the early days, I was always the only male in the audience, always. Um, and after a while, I realized I was probably the only heterosexual in the audience as well. I wasn't aware of that at first, but it, it, it got through to me. Uh, but, uh, and so part of it, in, in, in these situations where I, I, 
this kind of forces me to stand aside and say, what is going on around me here? It's something that, that is not part of my world at all, but, but I can serve as a kind of objective observer of it. Uh, when I'm describing my, my early experience at the WOW Cafe, the image that I use in the book is that, that uh, I felt when I went to the WOW Cafe like a big, shaggy, but not threatening, wet dog that had come in off the street. That as long as he didn't cause a fuss, people thought he was kind of cute. Uh, <laughs> And uh, I, so I, I mean, I was treated very well, but but it was peculiar, um, and and so uh, uh, yeah, there there the the uh, there is a lot of as you say, there's a lot of feeling of, and I like to ha be in a situation where, in fact, I don't quite fit in. I, I I and that in a way that sharpens all my senses of what's going on around. Um, since you spoke of animals, uh, what, what is the white tiger you miss? What, is, what are things you say, I just really wish I would have seen this in the US or internationally? What do you feel if you had seen it, it might have made it into the fifth, top 50? Oh. Well, um, over the years, very often, as, as I'm talking to people outside New York and talking about how many plays I see, I've often got the response of, oh, you must see everything. And of course, all of you in New York know nobody can see everything. You can't even see half of what's on. Uh, and so, uh, of course, there are many, many, many productions that I wish I had seen uh, that might have made it into the book. Um, I'd say I would, I would have to start with non-American productions because you will see in the book, uh, in addition to having a distinct bias toward uh, experimental theater and off and off off Broadway theater, I also have a, a bias toward European theater. Um, uh, and one cannot spend a lot of time in, in, in Europe if one is living in New York. And so there are, there are many directors, many playwrights. There's a lot of, once Robert Wilson left the country and started uh, producing more in Germany, there have been many Wilson productions, including very important ones that I, I missed and would love to have seen. I'd love to have seen more Heiner Miller work. And, and uh, there are a number of French directors that some of the Patrice Charot work and so on. Uh, in the United States, I've, I've, since I've been around, I've, I've seen a much more representative sample, I think, but, but you always miss certain things, and often I, I regret missing early works of people that later I realized, oh, these people are really very interesting. I wish I'd seen the, the first works they did. Well, like Charles Ludlam, for example, I didn't see the first plays, it was only when he was already beginning to be established, or, or squat theater, or, or uh, some of the very early Mabu Mines work, uh, some of the very, the very first uh, Wooster Group work, and some of the early Richard Foreman work. Usually, once these people got established, then I, they were on my radar, and I saw them fairly regularly. Um, I don't know that there are, uh, I don't know that there are major works that I didn't see that I, I now think, uh, well, I, had I known better, had I, had I been more interested, I guess they, they, probably they, they, they would be musicals. I'm more interested in musical theater now than I used to be. And uh, I didn't go to a lot of, of really wonderful musical theater of the, uh, in the 60s and 70s that, I mean, I saw hair, of course, and I mean, there were certain things that everybody saw. Uh, and I did see Funny Thing Happen on the Way to the Forum, which is the third thing. That, but I saw that really because I was interested in Zero Mostel, not because I was interested in musical theater. And I didn't even know who Stephen Sondheim was at that time. Uh, so, um, uh, it's, there, is, there are just so many possibilities. There's a lot of, a lot of early work at La Mama that I missed. 
some of the early Timo, Tomo Horgan works and so on. But most of the works that I think about that I wish I had seen are not really um, big, famous productions. They tend to be more, somewhat more obscure experimental work, which interests me rather more anyway. And well, you also didn't live in New York City for a very long time of your career, so it would have been tough for you to, to, to catch it all, but uh, it is remarkable what you see. So uh, we talked a little bit that somehow that idea of the real, which you also then wrote about it, sl slightly coming in, in the, the what is real, what's not, what uh, the Remini protocol work, you know, the uh, experts, yeah, you know, who work, say we, we don't like to work with actors anymore, and all these things we really followed early, early on and detected early on and you have a record in it, but so what do you feel, what's coming? Um, now you have seen 50 years, and there will be the next, there are lots of students here that I will see the next 50 years uh, in their lives. What do you feel, what's changing, what's coming, what, what, what do you see, the next waves um, that come to the beach? Well, that's a terribly difficult question, because you, who knows what will happen, and, and the, uh, uh, and and the artistic imagination is so wide ranging. Uh, I do think that the the last not only the last fifty years, but I would say pretty much the last hundred years, in all of the arts, uh, there has been a kind of a uh, uh, a feeling that I think was best articulated by a dear friend I had at Cornell, who was a professor of art history and who used to say, the main question in modern art is what can you do and still call it art? And there is that feeling of pushing the boundaries. What, how, how far can we go? What new things can we do? Uh, and each time you think, well, it really, and I, I think one of the pl things that we've seen, as you say, Frank, over the last, uh, um, well, certainly over the last 50 years and to some extent further back than that, but, but especially then is the, the increasing challenge of the borderline between mimesis or theater and real life. Uh, and I think the, the, the most recent, uh, most striking example of this uh, are things like Jerome Bell's Disabled Theater uh, and, and, and the, 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 the theatricalization of real disabilities. Um, uh, and, and I guess another example of, this, uh, of a, a different form of this is, is what Nature Theater of Oklahoma and people like that are doing of real real speech, real, uh, the presentation of not literary, not, not, uh, not elevated, but actual found speech and found material. Um, I think we'll see more of that. I think we'll see more of, uh, uh, of inner penetration of uh, audiences and, uh, uh, and actors. I think the immersive theater is the tip of the iceberg. There are uh, there are already a number of groups in Europe, I write about one of them in the book, the Cigna Theater, that g go much further in this direction of really encouraging audiences and actors to work together to create a theater story and a theater experience. I mean, really, really are co-creators of the experiment, experience in, in, in a far greater way than audiences have, have been before. I think we'll see more of that kind of work. There's no question we will see more of, uh, of the utilization of, of, of emerging technology, more, more influence of digital work and computer work, uh, more, more use, and th there's already a great deal of this, and this has been steadily growing ever since the 70s, of uh, intermixing of film, video, live video, and, and the performing body. I'm somewhat conservative about this, and that is, to me, all sorts of things can be thrown in, but unless somewhere you have a living body, it's not theater. Uh, not everybody agrees with me about that, but I, I think there's no question that that, that that is another area that is going to be uh, uh, more and more developed. 
there is a, uh, a growing, I can't say separation, uh, but a distinction between the theater experience, the performed action, and the pre-existing text that up until modern times, a play basically was the, the, the physical reenactment of a pre-existing text. Uh, that still is true, and I think will continue to be true, but I think we're going to see more and more other kinds of activity that are called theater that are much more separated from, uh, from uh, what we normally think of as a, as, a, as a dramatic text. All of those things are around already, uh, and I think will will continue to change and develop, and who knows what will come in in the future. Though it will, it will doubtless be in large part uh, uh, affected by what kind of technological world we're living in. Well, um, this is, uh, I think, uh, uh, something we all will be, will be wondering, and I would be excited to go, and the reason to wait for the perfect game, the perfect play for the next five years, and something will come, always has, and someone is working right now on it, and we don't know it. As you say, we might not see the early work that is changing. Um, maybe, uh, Brad, we could put up a little bit of the light uh, to the audience, so thank you for, uh, for, for, for listening, and I really think it's a, a, a rare moment to listen to someone who really has watched the field, um, has been deeply, deeply engaged in, in writing also, and influenced the field, so Marvin really, um, thank you for sharing, and thank you also for writing the book for everybody. Um, um, <clears throat> I think uh, I remember on Monday when we did the uh, Ron Water, Roy Cohn, Jack Smith event. Uh, Ron Water said in the end, uh, in the beginning of the play, he said, "You know, we did, we did the play for you. Hope you enjoy it. It was done for you. You know. So the same is with the book. I think it is, it is for you. So um, any comments, questions? Uh, we have a bit of time." We have a microphone, so we will also we will do it so we re hear you better, but we also record it. And so, yeah, so one, um, two, and then three. So, but let's start um, over here. And um, thank you. And maybe you say shortly who you are and uh, your name, what you do. Oh, hi, thanks. I'm Dan Hiuni. I'm a, a playwright here in New York. And I'm, I was wondering, Marvin, um, your experience in Newark uh, of being told to go back <laughs> to the city. Um, do you think there's a, a kind of an irony there in um, theater possibly being only preaching to the converted? Uh, or do you think you just chalk it up to a political moment um, in time? Uh, is there a danger? And, and if you don't mind, a second question is, um, did you see a chorus line and, and did you love it? Yeah, did I see what? Did, did, did you see a chorus line in 1976? A chorus, chorus line. Chorus line. Yeah, and did you uh, love it? Doesn't everybody love chorus line? Uh, no, I did. I, 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 I've seen several, uh, several productions of chorus line. I, I love the production. Uh, uh, I, I, don't, I don't know, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know where you, whether you want me to elaborate on that or not, I, I, I think what, uh, 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 what particularly appeals to me in Chorus Line is uh, uh, that in, in a number of ways, well, of course, it, it, it is meta-theatrical, and so uh, it, it, anybody in, in theater responds to some extent to that quality in it. But I also respond just to the, as I do in, in American musical theater in general, uh, to just the, uh, the sheer technique of it. It's just so beautifully done. Uh, I loved Hello, Dolly, for much the same reason, the new production. Uh, and um, uh, it is a, um, uh, uh, it's a, it's a very sentimentalized story, but, a, but a, a very effective in its sentimentalization, it seems to me. So I'm not sure what more you want me to say about it, but. Yeah, maybe about the Newark, what, preaching. Oh, well, the Newark. Uh, well, uh, yes, uh, I think the first thing is, it was a political moment. It was at a particular time, uh, and uh, uh, there, there was a very strong feeling uh, that, uh, uh, and this, this wasn't, Restricted to the black community, there were a lot of uh, a lot of uh, 
sort of uh, ethnic essentialism going around at, at that time of, uh, uh, indeed, it surprised me that I was always so welcome, well, not welcome, but tolerated at the WOW Cafe uh, because, uh, again, you could, you could easily say that the presence of a, of a heterosexual male here is not threatening, but it, it, it's dampening. It really doesn't allow us to sort of uh, communicate with each other and openly, frankly speak about uh, about our, our concerns, uh, and uh, this is not a, I mean, this is not entirely a, uh, a wrong idea. That is, uh, 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 looking back on it, I can, I mean, I would have really been a disruptive influence. At, this was a slave ship, uh, as a white guy sitting in the middle of the audience, that, that everybody would have been rather uncomfortable. I think they were probably right in sending me away. Uh, so it, it's a variety of things, but, but the, I think the specific answer is that it was very much a part of that political moment. Uh. I was wondering whether um, the years you spent teaching at Cornell made it very difficult for your theater going since it was so far away from New York City. Well, um, yes, it it was difficult, but I was determined, and I was young. Uh, the uh, when I was at Cornell, what I used to do was uh, I had a frightfully old, beat up Renault car, which I drove down to the city. In those days, Highway 17 was not modern, and so it took about five or six hours to drive down to the city. Worse if it were snowing or something. But what I would do would, uh, I would, uh, I would drive down on a, a, I'd get up early Saturday morning, I'd drive down, I would arrive in time for a matinee on Saturday. Uh, in those days, this is the early 60s, most off, off and off, well there wasn't an off, off Broadway, but most off Broadway theaters, uh, like the old Circle in the Square, places like that, had two shows on Saturday evening. They'd have a seven o'clock show and a ten o'clock show. So I could see three plays on Saturday. And then I, I, would, I would sleep on the floor of a friend's apartment who was lived up in, in Washington Heights. Uh, and then uh, the next day I would go to a matinee and drive back to Ithaca that night. Uh, so I could see four plays in a weekend by doing that, and I did that a lot. Uh, I mean, I, I think back, I was, I was, well, I was young. Uh, I was an adolescent, and I didn't know any better, and... Um, uh, you were a good driver. The, the, one, yeah. I, I did learn certain things. I mean, one night I remember, one, one, one trip I remember coming in and seeing... Uh, uh, for the third show on Saturday, I saw Rossin's Phaedra. <laughs> Terrible mistake. <laughs> Terrible mistake. And I thought, I'll never do that again. And so uh, I, w I was delighted when, when in the 60s, uh, the, the, uh, the off-Broadway musical began to be popular. After the Fantastics, there was Little Mary Sunshine, Leave It to Jane, uh, Ernest in Love, and I would then always end up Saturday with an off-Broadway musical. And that was okay. I could, I, could get through, I could get through three shows a night. But what that, what that means is uh, if almost every weekend I saw four shows, that's quite a lot. And of course, on vacations, I would just come down and pig out. Hello. Oh, that's loud. Hi, I'm uh, Brad Krumholtz. I'm a PhD candidate here at the Graduate Center, and Marvin is... Great my, to see you. <laughs> good to see you, too. <laughs> is my dissertation advisor. Um, so we have, a, I think... You like see to think, him now. It's good. Yeah, I like to think we have a little bit of a shorthand in communication, so I'll keep the question very, very simple and let you make it more complex. <laughs> uh, so the question is, did the, in the process of writing this book, um, did, you, did it make you feel big? Or did it make you feel small? Or something, com or some something. combination of that? Um, 
I guess it made me feel very lucky that here I am, 82 years old, still going to the theater several nights a week, loving it as much as ever, and always having new experiences. I just felt, I, I never had, I n never wrote a book that was as much fun as this one. Uh, but um, uh, I, I guess I, I felt happy about it. I, I don't know that I felt either, if I, if I had to choose between big and small, I guess I would choose big. It made me feel very good. Uh, I didn't feel, and indeed, I occasionally I would worry about. Uh, am uh, this is this is something that Frank brought up. I did worry occasionally. Am I creating a canon? Are people now going to pick up this book and have and say, okay, now we're going to study the late 20th century. This is the text we will use. That worried me. Uh, I, I mean, in that sense. I, do, I didn't want this book to be, or me to be, big in that sense. Uh, but I th I generally, generally the experience, I guess, was a, a euphoric one. It was, it, it was great pleasure to go back and just kind of re-experience these productions, even the ones I didn't like very much, like the Anne Bancroft Mother of Courage, which I hated. Uh, just to go back and 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 remember what that was like. Remember what it, what it meant to have a Brecht on Broadway and, and Eric Bentley sitting in one of the side boxes like the, the Grand Mufti uh, <laughs> presiding over this. Uh, I, I mean, just having that come back to me, I, I just enjoy, I mean, a lot of the book is obviously just nostalgia, but, the, but that was my main feeling in writing it. Maybe one or two more. Questions or remarks? Yeah. So we'll do um, one, and then two, three, and then. Hi, Marvin. I'm Karen Malpied. Of course, Karen. Oh, <laughs> so nice you could be here. Yeah, Karen. it's so nice to be here. Uh, first is not a question, just a comment, um, which is I'm so grateful that you write about the theater, and you are the most open-minded, uh, warm-hearted writer about the theater that I think we have in, in the country, and that's really wonderful and amazing, so thank you for thank, that. Thank you. And this is a brief question. What uh, kinds of uh, human relationships or, or situations do you think might be explored in, the, in these very difficult times that we're in and in the coming decade or so? That's a, that's a tough one. Would, I mean, we all wrestle with this, of, uh, of uh, uh, how, to, how to respond to very difficult times, almost unimaginable times. I mean, which we're, we're not, I mean, it's not as though we were Jews living in Nazi Germany or anything like that, but these are very tough times, and they're, they're times that our, our, our past experience doesn't help much with. We don't quite know how to, I mean, uh, you and I went through the 60s. We know what that was like, and we know, we sort of know how, what strategies were employed and what worked and what didn't. But this is, this is sort of like the 60s on speed. I mean, it, it is, there is a, there's a kind of, really, and I don't say this lightly, there's a kind of lunacy about this political and social situation. And how one, how one responds to that is something we all wrestle with. I, I think that uh, the, the only thing I could say, and certainly your work is continually going back to this, is that uh, we really have got to build up from loving and trusting human relationships. I mean, you, you've got you've to have that. And, and uh, we've got to have plays that deal with how those kinds of relationships are established and maintained. Uh, I think, uh, and I think the theater is as good a place as any to do that. I mean, we're not, I don't think we're gonna do it by writing plays about uh, uh, what the president's cabinet ought to do. Uh, I think it's, I think that, as you know, we all say all theater is local. I think that, yeah, all theater is personal, in fact. So, uh, 
I, that's the best answer I can give you, Kara. No, it, it's, it's a key question. Did you happen to see the uh, New York revival in the 50s and 60s of uh, Brecht's uh, uh, Three Penny Opera at the Theater de Lis with uh, La Tolenia? Yes. Your, yes, and your reminiscences of that experience. Well, uh, yeah, that, that, was a, um, uh, that was a wonderful production, and, and uh, uh, that was then followed by uh, the Tabori Brecht on Brecht also at the Theater de Lis. I remember both of them very well. They were, they were very um, seminal productions for young theater people at that time. Uh, uh, you, 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 you may know that, uh, uh, that when Three Penny Opera was first done at the Theater de Lis, nobody paid a lot of attention to it. And then uh, uh, Brooks Atkinson, bless his heart, uh, who was really the only New York critic who paid any attention to Off-Broadway at that time, mounted a kind of campaign and regularly, uh, uh, after, the, after the first run of, of Three Penny Opera was over, would, would often end his reviews of other plays was, this is all very well, but why don't they bring back the Three Penny Opera? Uh, with the result that when it did come back, and I don't remember when this was, but very early 60s, uh, then everybody wanted to see it, including me. Uh, I didn't see it the first time around. Uh, and it was, uh, um, it was a wonderful, very powerful production. Uh, the Lottie Lenya was, uh, uh, was not in it the night I saw it. I don't remember whether she was uh, temporarily replaced by somebody or what. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't see her until Brecht on Brecht when she came back and, 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 and performed in that. Uh, and that's a great regret. You say, what else would you like to have seen? I'd love to have seen Lottie Lenya in that production. Uh, but it was still a very powerful production and it was by, I imagine by Berliner Ensemble standards, it was probably pretty soft. But it, it seemed very jagged and in your face in the Theater de Lis in New York in the 1960s. And I thought, oh, this is really daring and challenging theater. Uh, so I, I was very impressed by it, and I think most people were. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, from that time on, and for the next 10 or 12 years, there was a strong feeling in the New York theater that we ought to do more Brecht. Uh, but that really only worked out in the off-Broadway theater. Breck never really made it on in the in the main the main theater, and I talk about this to some extent with the Anne Bancroft Mother Courage because I I I, I was interested in why was it that Breck was so unsuccessful in the American theater, and I I I talk about that in in and I in in that I also go back to the theater de Lise production uh, just in a little in 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 very minor. If I may follow that up. That means uh, that you have to buy the book. We want to have a book signing here, so the answer will also be in there, so I hope okay. you uh, will do that. It's a special prize, and normally it, it, does, it is much more. I think it's 30 instead of 50 or 55. But uh, one last question um, over there. And Marvin will sign, will also sign the books today. Okay. Thanks, Ben Alexander. Um, one playwright who I see is conspicuously absent from your non-canon is David Mamet, though I, um, I'd be willing to bet you've seen more than your share of David Mamet plays. Um, when I was brand new to the city in the early 90s and brand new to the theater scene, um, I was constantly hearing playwrights invoke David Mamet as this great guru and role model that we were all supposed to um, learn how to write our plays like. Um, and I was just wondering um, what observations and opinions you formed over time of um, David Mamet's plays, and e even more than that, the, uh, the influence that he was having over the whole culture of, of playwriting and playwrights. Well, the, the, um, um, there are three American playwrights, let me confess, that I feel embarrassed that they're not in the book, but they just didn't work out quite right. 
and that's Mammoth, Shepherd, and Albee. And you think, how could you possibly write a, write a book about uh, 50 years of, of playwriting that's based on America and not have an example of any of those three people? Well, I have August Wilson, I have Stephen Sondheim, I have Tony Kushner, and I guess to be honest, if I had to pick one trio over the other, I would go in a minute for the ones I picked. Uh, but as Taylor Max says, this is my 50 years. Uh, I, of, of the three people, I think that Shepard is the most original and if I had a play in there, uh, it would definitely be Buried Child, which I think is a wonderful play. Uh, I don't think Mammoth is as original, uh, though I like him a lot. Uh, I think that like a lot of playwrights, his earlier works are the best. I think he's faded over the years or, or become a little more repetitious. I think that the... Uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, that he certainly has left an important body of work and his plays will be revived, although I think probably not as much as Albies or Shepherds. Uh, but th you also point out a very important thing about, about Mammoth, and that is that, uh, like Albie, less like Shepherd, uh, he has been not only an inspiration, but specifically... Uh, an encourager of young playwrights, and his, he's he's very made a very important contribution in that way. Uh, the uh, uh, just the work he's done at the Atlantic Theater over the years in itself uh, is is a is a very important contribution. So uh, I uh, I am faintly embarrassed that he's not in the book, uh, only faintly, but I am faintly embarrassed. Well, um, thank you so much. But I think this is something we can all be very proud of uh, to, to have heard tonight and to have your book. So I, I'm waiting for Marvin and his, and his work. And um, hope you join us for the reception.